On mute. Sounds like you're starting. Hello, and welcome to Indie Apocalypse Radio. I am your host, Andrew. Only radio show about Indie Apocalypse, the independent monthly game bundle and zine. I am the editor and host of the show, and the creator, and the curator, and the general boss man of Indie Apocalypse. And I am here with my first guest, John. Hello, John. Hey, how's it going? Ah, it's going pretty good. It's going pretty well. Going all nice. right. Sweet. So, John, um, you were in issue seven of Indie Apocalypse with a mid clubber's night's dream. Nope, I had yep. too many. I, I close <laughs> mid clubber <laughs> night's it's a weird dream. Name. Added too there much possessiveness go. to that title. You've um, yeah. So the first thing I ask is, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, so I make games on the side for fun, mostly game jams. Um, I'm a software engineer by day, and I yeah, I like making games uh, on nights and weekends. All right. And I've been making mm-hmm. games for like 20 months, and most of those have been game jams. Yeah. I feel like I've done a lot of game jams but i haven't been doing this for that long right but game jams is very much like i mean in a lot of ways if you have been working and doing a lot of game jams you are i don't know ahead of someone who does it for five years but on one single game that they never finish you know maybe yeah i don't know (laughs) it's it's hard to say because like a lot of my projects have been pretty small yeah i think some of those people have done like bigger projects Right, but small projects don't matter. I mean, like, let me tell you, the scale of the project, I think, is irrelevant to, like, you know, how, you know, of a completed piece of work it is, you know? Mm-hmm. Something... Yeah, definitely. I think finishing is a good skill, for sure. Yes, yeah. And, you know, time to consume... It's not the same thing as value, I don't think. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. think someone can make a song that is a minute and a half and tell a more meaningful story than, like, a six-season se- six TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely agree. Quality over quantity. Right, exactly. Sometimes something is 30 seconds and it's good. Yeah, it's a memorable 30 seconds. Right. That's, you know, sometimes all you need is like Pit of a Thousand Snakes and you're good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, the, I have an important question that I always need to ask every guest that this question applies to, which is how did you hear about Indie Apocalypse? Well, um, I've, I, like I said, I do a lot of game jams, so I'm always on itch. And I think I've seen the the word in the apocalypse several times just from browsing around. And I think maybe it was on the front page. Maybe I saw it in the the jam page, but eventually I like, I clicked on it and I was like, well, this is awesome. You know, a bunch of cool experimental games who get paid and added into a a zine or zine. Is it zine? Zine, zine, because it's short for magazine. It's like they're like short magazines. magazines. Yeah, and it was just, it just seemed like a really cool concept. So I decided to join. All right. Because that's something I need to, that is my little bit of like um, information gathering. Because I'm like, how do I get more people to pay attention to it? And the answer seems to be, oh, they just browse the zine page or the jam page and it was there. Yeah. I might have seen it on the front page too, which might have helped. Yeah, because by the, th- I, I definitely noticed that like, when it got front page, I got a, a lot more submissions. Mm-hmm. And by your issue, it has definitely been like front page more often than not. Yeah. Oops. He, and he also, did. I thought it was super cool that you got to make your own page. I thought that was a really cool opportunity because I've never done anything like that. Yeah, that is it's something. Well, <laughs> you see... When I started this back in February, I was not expecting the entire country to be locked down, or the entire world, rather, to be locked down for all of 2020. 
So I thought it would yeah. be uh, easy to bring it to shows and instead of preparing a computer that can launch like say 110 games, have people be able to flip through a little piece, like a little booklet, a little zine, if you will, and check out all oh. the games. Oh, I didn't realize the point of the the page was to actually print it at some point. I thought it was a fully digital zine. Oh no, I actually have in my desk right next to me, I have a printed copy of every single zine. Oh wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Have, if you can hear me rustling paper, <laughs> this is all of them I have. Nice here. sound effects. Um, I mean, even if people, um, to plug, if you go to the Indiepocalypse Patreon, um, you can, and you sign up for the subscriber plus tier, you actually get a copy every, every month. And I get, and I go, I print out like the full bleed version, the expensive version, even the one that cost me more Ooh. money. The one I have to send away to Staples for, not the one that people that give me for free at Staples. Cause I think it's cool. Right. This is legit paper. Right. Yeah. Premium. <laughs> yeah. The ones I go to, the ones I just print like on demand at Staples, like they don't bleed all the way to the edge. So mm -hmm. you get that little like weird white border, but yeah, no, yeah. That was always my intended purpose was to like, so I have a show nearby where I live. That's like a punk flea market called Boston hassle. And it's like super cheap to go. And you can pretty much guarantee to break even. And I was like, you know, if I brought these here and it's people would be like, yeah, it's easy for people to flip through. It's easy for people right. to be like, oh, I'm not into video games. So I'm like, well, I know. But what if you tried these? These are not what you think of when you think of video games. Is my hope, at least. Mm -hmm. Would you would you also put the games on like a USB and sell it as like one package? My idea is that I would probably um, print postcards with the covers on them and put codes on the back of that. Mm, I see. Because USBs would be yeah, that would work. expensive. Yeah, good point. And I'm trying try to cut costs where I can't. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because people, these are not offering like a, you know, a lot of money. So yeah. I try to keep the overhead as low as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Pay as much back to the developers as I can, which is often yeah. not very much. I can't remember if you had gotten one of those lucky five dollar and twenty three cent, you know, random PayPal deposits. Before. No. No, but I was really happy to get something. And I think that's more than most people are offering to small indie developers. Yes. Yeah, that's, I mean, so that was, I think, yeah, no, if I, if you ever want to say something and I'm ever talking, you can just, the number one rule of Indie Apocalypse oh. Radio is just keep on going, then I'll shut up. <laughs> I think, I was just going to say, like, I think what you're doing is, is awesome. I think more people should be doing stuff like that. Well, thanks. Yeah. I, and it's, it's very good also to see the people like this Indie Apocalypse people go into other bundles that are far more monetarily successful. Cause I'm like, yeah. You get that actual bunny. You get my twenty dollars, and then join like the cyberpunk bundle and get like thousands of dollars. And I'm very happy for that. To be like the weird, yeah, but... the commercials or whatever equivalent. Right, but you know it's a good. You know everyone starts somewhere. Yeah. And it'll exist forever. Yeah. I like I like the idea. Part of this was I remember listening to like actors talk on like podcasts about getting like, you know, residual checks of like three dollars because they were in a TV show like five years down the line. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the idea of something just like you know passive income, as well as like small scale opportunities. Right. So you're saying there's a chance I might get that a $5 check a couple of years down the line? <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, I mean, nice. I could, how close are you right now? I have a spreadsheet that has like all of this information and I have like a payout tracker that shows how close everybody is. You're actually you're not that close. Sorry. You're like halfway oh, no. there. <laughs> Issue seven was not a popular one. It's hard. It's super hard to tell with like. I think I just broke down all the stats and issue seven is actually the lowest selling issue. 
Oh no! <laughs> and I don't even Dang like it. it's impossible. And issue six is like the highest selling by like a wild margin, and I don't know why. Interesting. Because hmm. I don't think like like there's that much of like a gulf in terms of like what the games are included in between each issue. Mm-hmm. I think you'll get like preferential differences here and there. Right. Nor do I think like any of the issues trade on like big names, you know? Yeah. No, I've, yeah, that's, I have no idea. <laughs> I think you're honestly one of the bigger, <laughs> as far as big named people, you're one of the bigger named developers, I think. Really? Me? I, I mean, I, for someone who seems to always get picked up by like warp door and like little mini coverages here and there. Oh Yeah. I think that person just likes me, the person who runs Warp Door. Yeah. Well, tell them to like me for once. I don't know what their issue is. <laughs> they should post you. <laughs> that's what That's what I'm... Listen, listen. I, I, I will fully admit that I'm like irrationally hung up on Warp Door for no particular reason other than I just don't understand why they mm-hmm. haven't posted yet. But... Well, they're I, doing something similar to you, I think, like curating a list of cool games. Yeah, but they posted about Dread X, and Dread X is doing the same thing. They posted oh, 10M- oh. They posted 10MG, and 10MG is doing the same thing. What's, what's the deal? I don't know the guy, but if I ever run into him, I'll, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll talk to him. Be like, be like, buddy, what's the deal? No, it, like, I, yeah. I, no do I think it will like immediately explode the sales. I'm just, like I said, it is irrational. But anyway, anyway, yeah. enough about me mm-hmm. and my irrationality. So you also do is from what, like I said, I see your work pop across the the stream often, not the stream we're doing now, but you know, the general stream mm-hmm. of social media. And you like, you trade a lot of different styles. So it's like, what is is that your approach when you're doing a game jam? It's like, let me just try something different every time. Ta- every time. Yeah, kind of. Um, I feel like I'm still in a learning phase like i don't think i found my niche of what kind of games i like to make and what kind of games other people like that i could make yeah so i try to do as many different kinds of games until i find one that i really like and so far i'm still searching but but in general i try not to do the same thing too many times but coincidentally the game I just made is pretty similar. It's almost like a, an evolution of the one that I submitted to Indie Apocalypse. Okay, so like another rhythm game or rhythm. Yeah, it's, it's so so both games have like an RPG character kind of movement uh, where you could talk to characters, and they both have a rhythm mechanic to them. And so I, I thought that was interesting. So maybe I did find some through lines. You're right. Now. Now let me posit this. Oh, or let me ask you this question. Now, do you, you do you know? I assume you use some like Unity or something. Uh, Godot. Okay, and uh, do you save like basically all of the work you do, or do you does it easily save into like libraries? So if you're like, oh, I want to make a rhythm game, or I want to have this RPG overworld mm-hmm. thing, it's easy just to plug right in. Uh, like in terms of if I've done it in the past, if I can just easily reuse the same code. Yeah. Um, the problem is that everything I've done is like a game jam. And so right. it's all terrible code. Oh, it's, okay. It's garbage. I don't even want to look at it. Even if it's some co- complex system that I've done for a game, I'll, I'd rather just recreate everything. Okay. So everything I do is like from, from, from a blank project. All right. Yeah. Cause when back way back when I was actually, you know, spending time making games, I would, mm-hmm. Um, like try and get it like good enough. And then sometimes I would go back and clean it up. So I could say like, Hey, I want to have like a platformer. So I just take my, I just plug in my platformer script and then I would just have a platform already made or I have like a right. movement already made. Yeah, actually I, yeah, there is stuff like that you can reuse. I, I have reused like, FSM code or like state management stuff. And for platformers, like you can reuse all the platformer gravity stuff. Yeah. Cause that stuff's always going to be the same. Now, have you considered perhaps, uh, 
you you now you say you like that RPG movement and then like with that yeah. rhythm element. Have you mm-hmm. considered like taking that as a core and using like just bolting these different like game styles into a world that has this like overworld RPG style movement? I I would love to do that. Um, I mean, I kind of I did a small version of it in uh, the game I just released recently, which is Cats on Mars. Yeah, that was a Secret Santa jam game. So it's a 30 day jam. I worked with an artist and a sound designer musician. And it kind of it kind of is that. And uh, that's funny because one of the the for the Secret Santa jam, so basically, I don't know how much you know about it, but game developers basically make Secret Santa games for other game developers. Yeah. So you write a letter, you describe your dream game or what you want for Christmas or whatever. Okay. And you get matched with another developer who's your Santa and they essentially try to make it. Yeah, I knew, I understood and, like the general concept, but not like where the prompt came mm-hmm. from. Yeah. So like the, just the, the, the other stranger gives you your prompt. And for Indie Apocalypse, I made a mid clever a mid I can't even say it, mid clever night stream. Yeah. <laughs> which has uh like animals and dancing and rhythm mechanic and it's kind of RPG like. And then the prompt that I got from the Secret Santa Jam was a cat dancer who enters a dance championship or something like that. And it was <laughs> all right. You know, it's like mechan with DDR like mechanics. So, okay, so yes, like so this. increasingly similar to what you had already made. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I think I would. And I also have a lot of love for, like, Earthbound, Mother 3, played a lot of Pokemon games, stuff like that. So, yeah, totally down to make more RPG stuff in the future. Yeah, because that was always one of my, like, weird, like, conceptual things I wanted to make. It's like, well, what if I made something that had like a core like like you know style of movement and interaction with the world but evoked different like scenes by using different mini games and that was like the core mechanic to it but it was always like it requires a lot of art and i'm not an artist yeah i the the challenge with all the like the mini games is that each of those you have to program and do these different like completely different systems almost like creating a, another game yeah to for each mini game, it's just a lot of work. And it's the easier end... to just, yeah, like use RPG Maker and just like attack and just do damage. Right. <laughs> you realize why even episodic games, all the episodes are like the same exact gameplay style. And it's exactly. Like all games are like, how can we kind of wiggle different moods into this one gameplay system we created? Right. And I think a lot of times you get a better game if you stick to like a simple core and try not to put too many things there. Yeah. I, I think that sometimes you could, you could, your gameplay could run really thin if you just spread yourself out too much. Right. Or just, or especially if it, does, it feels like, if it feels very like mini game y and not more mm-hmm. like. This not like not so intertwined with the you know the type of story they're telling at the moment or the scene they want to convey. Right. Like how yeah how do those mini games correlate back to the core game core gameplay or story? Right. Is it just like completely random? Then it might not not might not be as effective. Right. Or are they so infrequent that it they they're like jarring as opposed to like a kind of expectation of what is happening? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's also like a pretty big challenge besides like coding up all these mini games. Right. (laughs) Besides making games work. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I've never, so I've never used Godot. It's now, is that how, how begin, but I've seen a lot of people use Godot. Is Godot very like user beginner friendly? I think so. I think it depends what your programming experience is. Right. Because it does rely on uh, like a Python based programming language. Okay, but is it like a proprietary, like Godot? Yeah, 
called GD script. It's their own thing. But um, if you've used Unity before or Game Maker, I think you'd be comfortable with Godot. Okay, yeah. No, I think it's good because I feel like that is like the similar. I could you could probably say that about most things. Like oh, because Game Maker is built on like C plus plus, I believe, but within their own proprietary okay. language. And I would mm-hmm. say, yeah, if you've used Unity or any other like programming language, you can probably very easily use Game Maker. Right. And I'm sure someone's saying using Unity. I think what the answer is, I think all engines are basically the same, like in terms of like what you need to get done out of them. And most people could probably like wiggle out what they need to work. And some are obviously more specialized than others. Mm-hmm. Like if you're going to make a visual yeah. novel, probably just use RenPy. Probably. Save yourself a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the engine doesn't matter. And I think more people get hung up with deciding the right tools than they do actually making stuff. I think right. just pick a thing and just, just start making stuff. Yeah, because it's never going to be, like, perfect or, yeah, you know, the tool isn't going to make of... everything. Yeah, exactly. I think some people, like, would kind of shit on Game Maker, but Hyperlight Drifter was made with Game Maker. So yeah. you could do pretty much anything with it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about Undertale. Yeah, exactly. I remember when I was okay. playing, I was like, wow, this game is like very easy to make. Like, I'm like, oh, I see yeah. how this game works. Yeah. I, and, I cause like, it's so not much. about like complicated programming or you don't need complicated programming to like execute on like interesting ideas. Exactly. And I, there's some things that are kind of janky about it. You yeah. know? <laughs> No, that's, that's what I mean. Okay, it's like, the idea is good. Yeah, exactly. That's what, I, that's what I mean. Like, oh, I can see exactly how to recreate this. Right. It's like black backgrounds and white borders. Yeah. And it's all very simple, like, movements. And, Basic but it, movement, yeah. I mean, the text is the most complicated thing, but that's, like, because I'm bad at I don't know how to do, like, text reading from I'm not a good programmer now yeah. you've worked with like you work with like different artists and other like collaborators on all of your projects have you ever done something like solely by yourself yeah i have and i've learned that i'm a pretty terrible artist and musician <laughs> yeah it, i mean uh so i've done i think 20 game jams and i think my first 11 or 12 were done completely on my own and some of them I use Unity for before I switched to Godot. Yeah. And I think one of the problems was that I I saved like sound effects, music towards the end, and it always ended up hurting the project. Also, as soon as I started working with people who were way better than me, we made so much better stuff. Right. And they contributed so much more than just the assets. I mean, they contributed ideas and implementation and they just make the projects so much better than I could on my own. Yeah. And when you see assets, it changes like how, you know, how you perceive the code you're making and how you perceive the game you're making. Mm -hmm. When you see how something moves in the world. Right. And yeah, I just, I just, there is the the flip side of like, people like to do everything on their own because they have more control over it. And stuff like that and and i do see some merit in like doing everything you're on your own the first couple times maybe just so you could understand what is needed like yes you know like oh we're gonna we might need these sound effects um or like if you're working with an artist you'll you'll know like oh we're gonna do like 32 by 32 tiles or 16 by 16 like that kind of stuff you you don't know to think about until you've done it yourself Right. I, I, after I, you, yeah. I was going to say, I, I highly recommend to people that like you should do like at least one solo game jam just to understand like what the workload mm-hmm. is of everybody else. Exactly. I think so. And I think it helps everyone to be on the same page if everyone understands like what needs to be made in order to make the game. 
Right. You can't just say, oh, just make me, like, I just need three unique 3D yeah. models. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just make me a model. Yeah. In, what, in like, Go. a half hour. You can make a model in half an hour, right? Just, like, <laughs> you just squish together just something in Blender. Art. Yeah. It's Go make polygons. music. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's just strum on a guitar. You have a keyboard, right? You can make music in, like, five yeah. minutes. A song is only five minutes long, right? That's how long it takes yeah. to make a music. Yeah. Yeah, five minute song, easy. Yeah, five minute song takes you five minutes to make. That's all. All there is to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, yeah, I think that's where you see like project nightmares of people not understanding, and that's where you get like absurd scope creep because someone who is like the project right. manager does not understand how much work everybody has to put into everything in order to get a project. Exactly. Done. Yeah, exactly. That's where, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I think everyone has unrealistic expectations of how much they could achieve in a small amount of time. Yes. And until you like finish a project, then you like you learn. You learn the hard way. You're like, wow, I only made ten percent of what I thought I was going to make in a month. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> I started a um game by your cover jam game like right before it ended and i haven't touched it since mm -hmm. but did you finish it i got it like most of the way I, like i'm increasingly surprised at how quick like how much better i've gotten at programming and design over the years i'm like wow i can like hammer i hammered out like a lot of this and like a lot of my code worked right away nice which was, uh what uh what engine are you using I use Game Maker. Sweet. I originally st I started way way back in the day in Adventure Game Studio. Oh, which is like never heard making, of it. It's like an old engine for making. Um, if you know, do you know like the Wad Jedi games, like Blackwell no, Conspiracy not really. or um, um, I forget the name of it. These are engines or games. Games, games. I think they they started in in that engine. They're, they're like old Sierra and Lucas style adventure games. Okay, yeah, I've heard of like the Lucas games. Yeah, so there was an engine there was like for making those styles of games, but um, it had a ver it also it spoiled me on dialogue because it had, like it's because it's like a dialogue adventure game inventory system. Oh, okay. Spoiled you like it just gave it to you out of the box. It's like their dialogue system it. is so good. Like, yeah. like Adventure Game Studios dialogue system is like, it does branching, it does repeating dialogue, it just does dialogue. Because right. it's primarily like one of the things it's built for. So I'm just like, I've been chasing yeah. that dream ever since. I wish Godot had that. Does Game Maker have that out of the box? No, like I said, I've been chasing. I've actually like, yeah. it's, it's, it's like kind of, I'm kind of somewhere like where I'm kind of comfortable with like, I'm kind of like halfway between Adventure Game Studio and RenPy now, where I have like I've coded in my own like portraits moving and everything. Oh, nice! And I'm like, oh, here's how portraits move and spawn and all that stuff. And got half of the way there, but then I was like, it was one of those things where like, ah, oh, the project to, to, to use this requires me to make a lot of art, which I am not comfortable making at the moment. Hmm. Did you submit for the game by its cover jam? Um, or you started it? I started it. I started and I joined it. But I have not yet, like, I think in the new year, because I started this radio show and everything, and I mired in my own, like, self-loathing of my own failure for, like, a month or so. But... I think like, ah, 2021, I'm feeling good. I'm fairly ahead in terms of like scheduling the show, mm. you know, just scheduling the zine. I'm like, I'll have time to just like hammer out games again. Cause that's kind of what I want to do is I want to just like work through game by like those family case covers and just like jam out quick games based on those. Just like, yeah, I love those covers so much. Yeah. It's an awesome jam and covers. Yeah, and I just am a very big fan, especially the ones that adhere. And I, and I also used to do adhere very much to, like, Famicom limitations to the best of my abilities. Mm -hmm. 
Is Damathom like... is NES, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, this, the um, the I mean, the, the, sh- the exhibit has also expanded like so far beyond like Japanese artists at this point too. There's so many like Western artists that I recognize. Oh and, yeah, and, yeah. It's a Japanese site, right? Yes, because it was originally like a yeah. Japanese project, but then just like, like like they do with everything, the West just kind of snuck their way in, right, and started using it. But I like sticking to the Japanese. I, the one I'm doing right now is actually um, based on a cover from an artist that I had. I was in actually in issue six, I think. They submitted. They got like a. That's a whole other story about how I contacted an indie manga publisher and got indie Japanese artists to have their comics in one of the issues, which is was whole, it six? Yeah. Is that why that one is selling the most? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's also the only <laughs> one with like Japanese, like like an actual Japanese game in it from Japanese developers. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's what I also had to like. I had to fucking work to do to fill that issue. There were like twelve submissions, and I tracked down like eight of them personally. <laughs> Nobody submitted to that oh, one. Wow. So, how, so yeah. how do you how do you select which games to be included? So it's hard to describe because if you if you like submitted to the things in the past, I'm, anyone has. It's nothing like that, where I don't give it a score. Mm-hmm. If you go to my Twitter account and check out, I posted an article where I describe all sorts of things about Indie Apocalypse, but um, I tried to sum up like my submission acceptance. Basically, I have an Excel sheet, and I right. things that I think are bad and will never be in the zine, I put below a line. To say I played them, they're not going to be in it. Everything else goes above mm-hmm. it, and then I just kind of like sort by mood. Like, does this game strike me? Does is it interesting? Does it feel like you know? So and you then play I, all the games? Yeah, I play every game as I play as I go oh, through. Sick. I usually try to do them as I submit them, as people submit them, so I can finish them, like get mm-hmm. it out in a timely manner. Like the actual like confirmation, I can do it like this Saturday after submissions close. Right. And then I also like compare them against each other. Like so, I try to not jam pack it. Like so, is one zine doesn't have like, for instance, like seven fighting games or something in it. You know. Yeah. That Even if sense. they're all That'd like amazing. Be... Right. Yeah, because that wouldn't show that much difference if types of games right that would be very yeah. boring right and then they can always be included in later issues so i try to i go for like breadth mm-hmm. of style within the games and also just like things that feel interesting to me and things i that see I'm like, I see. like oh i like i like its style i like its vibe and like and it's also like undis- indescribable like something i'm just like i just like this thing's vibe mm-hmm but we are closing in on our half hour because these things actually just like okay. breeze by. <laughs> As, yeah. Um, so I have one question for you that I ask of every person who's on the show. Mm-hmm. And that is for all the gamers out there, what would you suggest for them that it's for, of something that is not a game that they get into? It doesn't even need to be in a, another piece of art necessarily, just like Ooh. something to expand your horizons. Hmm. Um, does it have to be related to game dev? Not at like all. Like how this could help them with games? No, no, not necessarily. If you, if you think like that, you can think like that, but like not even strictly like that. Just kind of like play something. I guess, I guess, uh, I really liked, I've been playing instruments pretty much my whole life. And I think that might have been one area where I was creative without really intentionally being creative and i think that probably has helped me like playing guitar and learning tabs but then learning the pentatonic scale and just like doing random notes and just being creative within that i think yeah i'd say 
instruments are dope. Okay. Did you play anything? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that is a, that has come up as a suggestion before, and it's a, it's a good suggestion. Just, like, try something. Yeah. Just noodle around. Guitar, piano, anything. Just jam. All right. And with that, we are going to go to our break. Hey, John, thanks for being here, but stick around, if you will. Cool. All right. Hello, and welcome back to Indiepocalypse Radio. I am still you motherfucker. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm still your host, Andrew, and now we're here with a new guest, Mike. Oh, shit. I didn't realize I didn't know I said your last name. Michael, oh, no, it's okay. It's Clamaris. Michael Clamaris? Clamaris? Yeah. Uh, it, huh. It's fine. Everyone pronounces it differently. Well, I like to pronounce it's people's fine. names the <laughs> proper way. Oh, you got it. It's, it's close enough. So, yeah, it's Clamaris. Okay, perfect. Um, I know. I just saw. I'd, I don't look at the chat, but I do look at bots, and I do, like, fuck, how do you ban people on Twitch? I don't... Ah, uh, there we go, ban. Found it. Yay. Okay. Anyway, anyway. Don't try to fucking sell me free gold on my Twitch stream. I'll allow none of that. But, um, hello. How you doing, Michael? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Just keeping it cool, keeping it casual. Um, so, hey, yeah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am a programmer during the day. I just work at a university doing programming. Uh, and in my spare time, I do some game design stuff, little games and tabletop RPGs. And also um, just help organize meetups in the Michigan, Detroit, Ann Arbor area, uh, and just post a lot about indie games being made in Michigan uh, uh, through like a little indie games collective called Locally Sourced. Which is good because I mean there there should be indie games collectives everywhere. Yeah, I'm obsessed with it. I love following all the different states and seeing what they're doing. I had an idea once that like, well, what if we um like because a friend. A friend, if you go to, oh, fuck, what's the name of his website? I think it's like funghost.com. I want to keep talking while I look this up. So uh, Chris Mayer, who's like kind of like, okay, so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I was about to say, because you have that question every week that, like, how did you find about Indie Apocalypse? Yeah, how did you find out about it? I think I think I did find out about it through him retweeting it. Okay. And I was, I think, or his Boston Indies, which I think he runs. Yeah, I believe he runs thing? it now, or at least he runs a Twitter account. I've uh, listen. I am very tangentially related to because I'm, I'm not in Boston. Like I said, it's just New England small, but like also I don't live in Boston. I'm far enough away to it that I'm like not connected to the scene. Also, I'm like naturally disconnected from every scene, just as a personality trait. Oh. So. <laughs> um, so- I don't know. I don't know their leadership structures at any given moment. Oh, I don't know. He does have okay. the Twitter account. So I think, yeah. So I have the Fun Ghost website. Okay, so his tweet is or handle is. Anyway, so I yeah, I pulled up the Fun Ghost website, and I think I followed him specifically because uh, he posted a picture of like being at like. A Boston craft fair or something like Probably that? Probably Boston. I mean, it might have been like a craft fair. It might have been like what I mentioned in the segment one, Boston Hassle, which yeah. is that punk food it, market. And it, that's probably what it was. But like, I like that he had the table set up. You can, his website has a picture of it. Of, yeah. uh, Fungos.com. Like, of, um, it looks like a table, like a checkered tablecloth with some plants on it and like, Games made him the Boston area, like yeah, he on floppy like, disks. Yeah, he so, it was. It was like very much like a farmer's market. It was the intent. It was just like aesthetic yeah. intent. It's great, and um, I think like I even DM'd him at some point just to ask further questions. But I, I'm always just trying to like see what ways or gimmicks people can do to sell games to more public facing areas because no one knows about local right. game dev scenes. 
Yeah, I would so. say that, I mean, if you can find something as cheap, because Boston Hassle is like $40 if you bring your own table. So you like guarantee to break even no matter what, pretty much. Cause it's also and I like, think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Art show. So people are there for like weird stuff, you know? Okay. Yeah. And I think I ended up, so at, not last summer, but the year before, um, uh, a bunch of Michigan game developers kind of teamed together to do like a big booth at a Maker Fair, yeah. and and then this last year I was trying, it fell through because of pandemic, but we're going to have a thing at a film festival in Ann Arbor. Um, so it was just I'm just like really into demoing games at weird spots. And I think that's uh, like what people need to do, really. Yeah, I think so because I mean, there's no way you would know about this stuff on your unless you're like specific, specifically trying to find it. Like I didn't know about a lot of these people until I stumbled. I basically stumbled across the Ann Arbor meetups for IGDA, IGDA Ann Arbor because Night Dive I think retweeted something about how the developer for this old DOS game Descent was going to speak at a meetup. And so right. um, that was just from, and that's from someone who's probably online too much like me. So like, unless you're like really looking, you'll never find it. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's just important for indie developers to try to get into these weird spots because a lot of game outlets aren't going to cover their game, which right. sucks. Yeah, and... those, I mean, we can get into that, but like, just because it, it, so you have to find all these weird, other maybe possibly gimmicky ways to kind of get attention. Right. I always, I always promote talk about like the ideal, the i, for is like as messed up as every industry is for you know independent artists, the i the ideal often can feel like music is like oh look how great it is like there's so much like indie music coverage is like sites upon sites dedicated to like you know primarily independent music coverage and there's like a culture of for better or for worse there's a culture of snobbery within music where it's like i want to get into things before everybody else hears about them Mm -hmm. i want to go to these base i want to go to these shows in somebody's apartment these house shows and it's like I saw this band in an apartment with 20 other people before anyone had ever heard of them. Yeah. And it's almost r- romanticized to a fault sometimes right. where it's like, <laughs> once the bank gets big enough, right now you don't like them anymore. And, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. So they're really, eh, it's kind of there for indie games a little bit, but not to the same extent as like, it's, it's harder. I mean, because there aren't like, there's indie movie festivals where I live, but there's no indie games festivals and, you know, music venues will play, have bands that are small and right. Not right now, but you know, uh, once things are. Yeah. And healthy. like, what's, what's so, the, what's the indie game equivalent of like being an opener for somebody, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's just, oh, yeah, it, it's frustrating. So I, mean, I guess technically you could put like games on demos within bigger games. I guess those are technically you can, but it's all tied into like publishers. So I mean, and so unless like Ubisoft has a tiny, you know, it's it's weird. There used to be demo discs, which was a thing, and not anymore. And same with like by like having a magazine, um, you know, games magazines used to being subscribed to one meant that you would like read about things you normally weren't looking for yeah um even if it wasn't like i don't know the best indie games coverage or if it even it didn't really exist right back then but um yeah so it's it's weird it's a really weird spot and uh indie game sites like a lot of the bigger or not indie game sites games sites are hesitant to cover in the games because they don't get the hits that bigger games, which I don't, I did, don't really blame them for. But right, that's it's, I mean that's the business. It's the business, and you, it's, everything's tied into this weird like everything's tied to ad revenue, 
barely <laughs> Which is pays barely there and, as it is. and so uh, yeah I, I don't know what the solution is other than just to be like really obnoxious and scream about supporting indie games all the time um so i don't know i don't yeah I mean, I don't think there is a solution. I think it is, the the best people can do is just like keep on working at it and keep you know support the old the old artistic rally cry or support your local scene. Basically, it's just yeah, hit your head on, bang your head on different things until like right whether that something whether that, comes gets through. Right, whether that local scene means your literal like physically local scene like in Michigan or your local scene like your Bitsy forum, you know. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes I mean, it seems like there are successful cases, sort of, and like, like the original, originally locally sourced was supposed to be a thing, sort of like Wagos Cheros in Austin. Yeah. If you're familiar with, okay, yeah, so I, I had someone from Austin on last week. I was learning a little bit about Wagos Rancheros. I can't remember, okay, if on air though or not. Um, so it was going to be kind of like this hangout thing that. I, yeah, but um, it, 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 so it's gradually like changing thing until something really works. It seems like that's sort of the indie game compilations we're organizing, and just like the things like Maker Fair were a hit. It's just yeah, where it's, the formula is not hasn't really been figured out. Right. For I don't think for anyone really, if, unless you live in a big city. Right, and um, even then you've got like all these like disparate different organizations, and really like none of them are big enough to accomplish anything. It's like, but also which one becomes the de facto, like head organization. It's really interesting. Well, like Boston, for example, has a bunch of different things. I know they have like Boston Indies. There's, um, an IGDA chapter that renamed itself every other month. I feel like. Oh, really? Does it? Okay. No, I, I know it, there's like. A, I feel like it's gone it, by. Like sometimes it goes by IGDA. Sometimes it goes by. I think postmortem might also be that, or maybe that's just a, night they do that has become a colloquial name i i don't know well i know there it looks like there's a boston fig thing yeah that's a, a, that's partially run by i don't see like i said i don't know leadership <laughs> structures <laughs> um there's a big interactive fiction community there yes that has their own meetups um They've yeah, got it's, like tabletop groups yep yeah i know someone that was they just moved out of boston but they were running a tabletop group so it's just it's yeah, I, I, very weird. I don't know. It, it, who knows what we if anyone ever figures out like a workflow that makes sense and can right. kind of help unite people. I don't know. And sustain also be like financially sustainable. I know. Yeah, I know. That's yeah, the, for you, the tr- that's the I, tricky part. <laughs> well, for me, I, I kind of cheated because I. It's just kind of asking. So, for people listening, so I also organize bundles, right? Kind of, sort of like indie apocalypse, but not as ambitious. But, um, and it's just a quarterly thing. Um, but you know, it's, you know listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> nobody needs to be as absurdly like unnecessarily ambitious as indie, po- which like that's also treating my own horn to some extent. But you know, no, I'm so glad that. The apocalypse exists. But I'm, I'm it, sure, yeah, it's, uh, uh, when I step back from it, like getting ten games plus a cover, like I understand, like oh, I guess this is an ambitious undertaking for like one person. Oh, it's a little extreme. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's good. Um, but yeah, and so like I've been in the Michigan community for a couple years now. I yeah, think. and so I can at least set, put out like. I know enough people where I can say, does anyone want to make a tiny game for this bundle? I think we just, like, first one came out in the late spring, I think because we're all just sitting at home or something. I don't know why. Right. But, um, yeah, and so we did we'll that. See, well, like, uh, and, like, I, I feel like there's an indie game magazine that might have launched in late winter. It could have been a catalyst. I don't know, though. <laughs> I'm trying to... Well, I... Yeah, no, never mind. But, um... 
So, like, are all the games for your locally sourced bundles, are those all, like, new created games? Those are all new games, okay. yeah. Because it's just, like, an excuse to just make things that are supposed to take, like, a couple weeks right. or something. It's a, well, the pitch is supposed to be make a thing that you could make during a week-long game jam, except let's stretch that time over, like, a couple of months so you're not right. stressed out. Yeah. And you're just making little things. Um, so... That seems like it's gone well, but I mean, unlike in the apocalypse, I'm kind of cheating by not paying up front. But I think just because I know the people, and we're just like all figuring it out. I don't know. It's just we're just experimenting. No, I mean, I'm, it's people. Just, it's more of a collective than like one person organizing. Yeah. Things. Um, and I think I mean, I th- if, from from an outsider looking in, it works because you. Modesty is your goal. You set. You hit it every month or every quarter. So it seems. See. Yeah, yeah. This last one was weird because it was like the first time where I set a public facing goal and like it was a little tougher to hit that goal. Oh. Okay. Uh, because I made. I don't know if it was a mistake or what, but just like launching it around this time, especially on Black Friday, because yeah. my internal logic was okay. Is this the day where it just isn't going to take a cut from sales? It's going to be great. And like, I didn't think about how every other person in the world is going to have a sale. Um, right. <laughs> but eventually hit it. Uh, it just took a lot of yelling about the bundle existing. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting figuring out how all these places do it. Um, yeah. I'm at a the ones I do are, I have a maybe a disadvantage because I can't send keys to people because it's a bundle, a co-op bundle. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so. part of why I do it as like initially instead of doing it as a bundle, which would be a lot easier in terms of like payment and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's but why I did that. I can't send keys out, and I can't like, for instance, if I go to a show, I can't sell keys. Oh, okay, that makes sense. It makes yeah. My life would be so much. I think for a lot of people, their lives would be so much easier if it would just add revenue sharing. Yeah, I when I started, <laughs> I looked up. I'm like, is there really? I found a lot of forums that are requesting revenue sharing, but no. There, so there's so many people asking about it, and I've never seen a response from Itch. Right. Acknowledging it, which is weird because they're so good about support for everything else, and it's right. it's weird because it's, I feel in theory it feels like you could set it up like a co-op bundle where right, you just can, can you attach multiple collaborators to like a single store page i wish you could you can't oh, but okay it just you well that's why i like i know people who work on tabletop rpgs who would just haven't would love to put their stuff on edge but just can't because they want to do revenue sharing right and the only workaround i've ever seen for this was um uh i can't remember the do androids prey and Cellular Harvest, which are both designed or co-designed by Zolivar Nelson Jr. Um, okay. Apologies if I mispronounce his name, but um, where they do like basically, I like you Android's Prey had a red and blue edition. Yeah. It's basically just tinted different colors, and as part of a co-op bundle, and like each person who worked on the game had their own version same with cellular harvest there's like oh, a red and okay. green or something but it was basically two versions of the game one was during the day one was at night time and they were assigned to different people as the product creator and like you would buy the co-op bundle because it's cheaper yeah it's ridiculous it's a weird workaround just to get around just to allow for revenue sharing on a game site Wait, where you're saying you don't want to <laughs> collect 110 paypal addresses it's oh yeah, it's, I know. I like. I think we DM'd about it at some point where, uh, I I think like I was asking you how you did this, and I was just, it's not worth. It. But I don't know. Maybe it is. It, maybe I should. Uh, I also set up. This. I also set up mass payments, so it's actually very easy. Oh okay. So it, I just basically I just put them in a spreadsheet, and I just upload that spreadsheet to PayPal, and it just pays everyone out. Okay. Well, you know, even. Even co-op bundles are kind of a headache because you can only split by whole percentages. Oh. So if it's a number of games... So 
I try to set it up so it's split evenly across people, the number of people who have submitted a game, so like $1 per game. Right. Um, and so if your game has six, seven, eight, nine people in it, it can't divide evenly. Yeah. Um, so like with this most recent one, I just chose that make 2% less than everyone else because I got so exhausted by doing payments to everyone right from the previous one it was just absurd so yeah the the whole itch marketplace of like doing payments is such a weird process yeah it's yeah it's yeah it's, it's very far sorry. from perfect <laughs> sorry thank you for letting me go on my little rant about itch payments no and, that means uh, People just seem to keep talking about bad things until they stop being. I mean, and who knows if this is just like legacy code in the itch pro in like the itch backend that's like would be like a huge upending to change, you know? Oh, I mean, I mean, I love itch, so I, yeah. I hope it's not. Um, I wouldn't keep using the site if I didn't, but uh, it's just a weird like one off thing. It's just right. this one thing where, and I know they only have like a couple people working there. I'm yeah. Sure, I don't. You know, I, I don't like think how, it's like. And how like how many extreme test cases are there where it's like, I'm collecting a bunch of people who don't necessarily work know each other, so they want to do revenue share, because there's like, kind of like inherent like, oh, I don't want to ha have to funnel all the money through a single person, you know, and it's just more comfortable for them to do revenue share. I feel like those number of people is fairly low. I mean, but a lot of games are made on a team, so right. that's why I, I'm surprised that it's not. Um, and I assume that they looked at Bandcamp and like it just bit is stuff how Bandcamp works. Maybe I don't know um, where music's usually like. Not always like one person, but right. I, I guess I don't know how Bandcamp does it. Does it have revenue? Share? I don't know you. Um, eh, that's a good. Point. I don't actually know for sure because I know, I. I don't. Hmm. I'm not, I don't know. I was going to say they don't, but maybe they do. Um, because I know there's compilations. Right. On their side. So. I don't know then. I guess I'm just. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's set up. Um. I don't know. Yeah. It's. I, my quick search is about stuff about sharing with Bandcamp, like with the revenue share of Bandcamp, not between different, you know, members of a band. Yeah, so, so maybe they don't allow it. But I don't know. I wish it had that. I mean, I wish every single storefront had Bandcamp's ticker, really. It's so good. It's it had so, what? The little ticker on the front page of Bandcamp. Oh yeah, I would love that. That's it's the best. Yeah, I love watching that, especially it's, on the Bandcamp Fridays. It's like where it's just like yeah, it's getting just, along. That would be nice. It's just beautiful, sure. like I, algorithm free, like feed. Yeah, but if people, I guess anyone could pull it up. But you can see like every album purchase just pop up on the site and yeah, or how much. It's really cool. And, and what country it's coming from, which right, is so, really neat. Yeah, it's like hey, look, people are buying this stuff from all over the world. And it's just like, come on, itch. Yeah, but they have I, a lot of neat stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. But um, it's. I think, it'll, like, I think it'll take time. Like they just don't have. They probably just don't have the infrastructure to have. Like you know. I don't think they do. Yeah, they I have, think like, that's really like it. that, or like they have like a major, like a major, like like a huge editorial side, like Bandcamp does. Because yeah, they, I mean, I don't blame them for not having that. Yeah, that, they're also not like. They don't have the same kind of like increasing amount of like market share or like power or however, like whatever phrase you want to use to describe people are paying attention to Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we saw like every, what, the first Friday of every month, people, yeah. Would, at least maybe because I follow a lot of musicians as well, but just like everyone yelling, it's Bandcamp Friday. And like me basically basing my entire music purchasing schedule around this one Friday of every month. Right. Um, which is goofy, but it, uh, I really like that they did that. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I I t- tend to do that now also simply because, like, sometimes I'm like, well, I need to get music for the show. So, like, let's head over to Bandcamp. Even if I l- listen to it regularly, I'm like, well, do I own it yet? No, I got to buy it. Because I may, I may be, I may be run a pirate radio, but I have a pirate radio with ethics. I pay for all, I own all the music that I play here. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why you don't, it doesn't get into the podcast. Right. I, I think. Oh, I also, yeah, that's a whole nightmare of putting in the podcast. Um, It kind of, yeah. I don't know if you've ever listened to uh, the best show, like this comedy. Yeah. Podcast. It does the same thing where I'll have songs in the live feed, but not. Um, from like indie musicians and stuff, but then it kind of gets cut out of the downloadable version. Right, because it's like at that point you hit licensing, and, it, and at least at one point it was a like actual radio show. Yeah, it was. Yeah. For his unfamiliar, I like that's one of those things where it's like it's just so massive. I'm like, I don't know where to start. I'm just not going to bother oh. starting. Okay, so you're aware of it. Yeah, it used to be on WFMU. Yeah. Which is I, a. I know, if I know, like one of the hosts is the drummer of the Mountain Goats. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, Richter. he's like, he calls in about every episode as a fictional character from this made-up city. It's like a Springfield from The Simpsons type thing. Okay. Of all these, it's weird. It's weird. There's a whole meta thing where the drummer uh, from the Mountain Goats <laughs> pretends to be like these characters from some made-up city in New Jersey. I am um, aware of alt comedy on the internet, you know? Yeah. So that's a show that I've been obsessed with. And it's been on for like the last 20 years right. now. Um, but yeah, and then, yeah, it's hosted by the voice of Greg Universe from Steven Universe. Yes. Um, that's yeah, Anyway, yeah, so. Yeah, that's, that, what that's, yeah, that's the, just the subtle doing. weird thing is like, go th- go, I thought about that. I actually went back recently into IMDb to see if that was like, because like, Modern modern children's television is full of a lot of like weird alt comedians. And, yeah, like people basically people people here on podcasts. I'm like, um, I'm like, what the hell is Maria Bamford doing in Avatar? Yeah, it's funny. It's I, I assume that's just like whoever is directing the shows. Uh, you see that line, kids show, and like, it doesn't seem like. Saw it as much in the '90s, except for the Adventures of Pete and Pete. Yeah, I don't know it, if you ever saw that. I didn't. But... I mean, if I did, it's gone from my memory. Oh, okay. It was a show, a live action show in the yeah. early '90s on Nickelodeon, but it had like a lot of alternative musicians in it, like Debbie Harry from Blondie and Michael Stipe from REM and stuff. Yeah. Just like a lot of ran- Iggy Pop is a major character or major actor in the show. It was just weird, but yeah, I, it's it's fun to see that happen yeah as far as i could tell it didn't happen as much then or there was at least i was far less aware the people did not stick out to me as much yeah i don't i don't remember it as much that's like the one exception i think that's why it has a cult following is because of the weird all these alternative people being in it but now it it happens kind of fairly often (laughs) right you see you like pan oswald and a lot of cartoons and stuff um It's like, oh, I know which podcast these persons are listening to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By by who they have on their their cartoons nowadays. Yeah, Weird Al's. And, I mean, I think Weird Al's in a lot of stuff just because people grew up listening to him. Right. No, he's he, maybe Weird Al's going to get his Bob Odenkirk style resurgence. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's been one of my favorite things to watch because, like, it's still weird to me that he's in, like, a John Wick style action movie. Right. I, I, um, I'm still not sure if it's not a comedy. <laughs> it's so fun because, yeah, because forever, like whole, always in my brain, just be the Mr. Show guy, right. even though he's in the, he's a great actor. It's not a slight against him. It's just, it's, that's what he was for whatever, 15 right. years. Right, and like I mean, even when you look at it, like mainstream success, it was mostly David Cross who was like in whatever, yeah, like Alvin the Chipmunks, or whatever. Yeah, or, he was in a lot of small roles and stuff, and yeah, he was the far more famous for one for the longest time. And now, like, maybe we'll see Bob Odenkirk get an Oscar nomination at some point or something, <laughs> just because he's doing all these dramas now. Right. Weird, but anyway, anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not very funny. weird tangent. Sorry. Going on a weird ta- no, I mean, I like primarily the only podcast I listen to are comedy podcasts. So, and I like just comedy in general and weird alternative indie, ultra ironic. I can't see the whatever. It's like, what is, the, what is, the, when does the game stop and when does it begin comedy? Mm-hmm. But this is theoretically a podcast about video games, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> it's not really. I don't care about video games. What am I talking about? Oh. Listen, tell me, tell me about Phantasmagoria. Oh, okay, great. Uh, one I or two. Do you movie. prefer one or two? I mean, uh, two is the one that I have my weird obsession with. I mean, like, I one is think... actually just like. Phantasmagoria 1 is just a totally normal 90s FMV game for yeah. everyone who's not old. Um, and then the sequel is kind of unintentionally funny, but also like weirdly very progressive. It was designed by, was it Shannon Lorelei? Is that Lorelei Shannon? Who co-designed King's Quest Seven? Um, the first game was designed by Robert, Roberta Williams. Yeah. King's Quest. And um, so, yeah, uh, the sequel has nothing to do with the first game. Oh, no, um, no. I, I learned after... Like, there's, my, there's a reference. There's yes, one reference. I learned about in my 50th map. rewatch of a Let's Play that they, that they... Like, how did I miss that every other time? There's, like, where you, like, grab some mail and it has the person from the first game. Yeah. Like, their name appears. Yeah, that's probably like, why like you missed it. like an ad for a book or something. Like yeah. Like a pamphlet yeah. for her new latest it's, novel. It's, yeah, I yeah, that's probably why you missed it, because you would have to remember the name of the character from the first game. But I, don't, I mean, um, I, I also rewatched playthroughs of Phantasmagoria 1 a lot. Neither is really that great. Like, I, like it's weird, like, ironic. So even though I mostly unironically like the genre, right? But and I was recently watching a playthrough of Gear Real Night Two by Just Morissette, who, who um, I think that's his name, the person that does the Soda Machine and video games website. I have no idea um, what you're talking about. Okay, never mind. There's someone who's cataloging. Yeah, I had, I understand the, the concept. Machine. Okay, I, I've heard about the um, dogs, but um. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I have talked. I referenced the second game more than I should, just because it's like it's weird. You okay? So you've played it before, and it's I've like never played it. Weird. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So you but just I, watched. It. I just watched it. I here's the thing. I don't. I've never played adventure. I don't. <laughs> I've never played that many. Like I don't know. Oh, okay. I've never played an FMV um, adventure game. The first, yeah, the second game is weird because you spend you basically spend the first fifth of the game showing pictures to people. Like you're just yeah. walking around your office and walking into everyone's cubicle and this has all been filmed. And you're just like, remember this Christmas party? Well, here it is. Like, it's just like, it's just the weirdest game, but it's also the first time I've, it came out in 97, I think 96, 97. Um, it was the first time I've seen, saw positive portrayal of a gay person in the game first portrayal of a bisexual person in the game um yeah i mean it's, it's really interesting it, like it's not it doesn't like punch down right anyone so there's there's like a sort of unironic appreciation of the game even if it's like weirdly designed and like um a bad adventure game <laughs> yeah it's not a good adventure game at all no it's most of the FMV games from the era aren't that good, except basically Gabriel Knight 2 and the Tex Murphy games, um, where the Tex Murphy games kind of lean more on being campy, intentionally. Right. Um, and then, yeah, and so the genres kind of come back recently, because, but, like, good. Because you have, like, her story and telling lies and contradiction kind of does the leaning. Like, it's walked a very fine line. Right. It's, being on like campy but not like terrible it's a very right, hard balance like, to do yeah like it's it's i don't know tongue it's, it's cheeky is cheeky the right word for what contradiction kind of it's it feels like 
it's really interesting because I feel like everyone in the game, or almost everyone in that game plays it straight, except for the main actor, who's right. kind of like doing a Nicolas Cage type thing or something, where he's just going for it and just being very over the top, but yeah. it works. But they're all like, they're, I think they're all like hard committing, which I think is very important. Yeah. I think it would, because, yeah, I think it'd be very easy for that game to fall apart. Like, or if they tried to do a sequel. Yeah. Even though I'd like to see one because the game's fun to play, it's it's still a decent adventure game and doesn't need the full motion video weirdness. But I think if they tried to replicate it, it'd be like I don't know. I mean, because they knew what they were doing. And when it's not like when people make it's not like bad movies where right. you have a bad movie like Birdemic and then a sequel that tries to be bad on purpose and it's just unwatchable. Right. Bad right. Company bad comedy is unwatchable now um, <laughs> yes i'm going to let you finish this thought but we could go on forever okay about, i'm sorry <laughs> about the, the 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 concept of like bet like how bad enjoyable bad art and like there's that i think it's only made by people here is my my final thesis on bad art i think it enjoyable bad art is only made by the very the least talented and the most talented but also the extremely ambitious with in terms of both. Yeah, I think that's the important part is you have to put like yourself into the bad art. Like, is it like I I I do not enjoy watching Michael Bay movies at all because they're just like cynical gash grabs. Right. But uh, for the most part, and then but like I'll watch. I don't know. I mean, I I've watched The Room a bunch of times or Birdemic or whatever. Where like they're trying to have. It's important to them, and you can still sort of respect it. It's weird. I mean, it can it can get mean pretty quickly if you're trying right. to like. But anyway, but part of themselves, like, and they're it goes into the movie, and they're trying to have an important message. Uh, important question that I gotta ask. Okay. Before, before the regular important question, this is a semi related important. Have you seen the movie House? Or House uh, as people what? sometimes like to call it. Wait, what movie? House, the Japanese film. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love that movie. Okay. Now, do you think that's a bad movie? No. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I think, I, think that's a, I think that's actually a good movie. And, like, yes. they're intentionally, it's just, it's, it feels like a Scooby-Doo movie. Or, like, it's, it's weird. Not Maybe not a Scooby-Doo movie, but right. it's, it's doing its own thing, and it's very unusual and yeah. interesting. Okay. I love it's, it. That is something I feel like you could show someone and it could have it could have like a very room like they could like view on it, but I, I will fight tooth and nail. I think that is like a movie that does everything it wants to do and it's intentionally a very good movie. Yes, I agree. I own that T shirt because I like I it. do not have the T shirt, but I, I've seen it. It's good. I like uh, the movie poster a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's exceptional. But um now the other really important question non games for hot gamers out there yeah um i've been thinking about i'm trying to think about that because you ask this every episode and I think because it's all i listened to yesterday yeah um and christmas eve is uh i think it's i i would recommend people checking out college radio or public radio stations um because I think it's important to be exposed to art, music, stuff that you're not necessarily seeking out or won't have presented to you through an algorithm. Yeah. This goes through other kinds of art, too. It's just like you're going experiencing curated uh, sources versus yes. algorithms because right. you'll like. see things that you weren't looking for and sometimes you won't like it. But sometimes you'll be pleasantly surprised. No, I think that's the beauty of like curated like art and anthologies and just like radio shows is like, well, I didn't like this one. Or like that's why I gravitate I really like guest based podcasts. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've I've yeah, I've noticed that too. Like because I like, oh, it's, I learn about new people constantly. And sometimes I'll go down this weird rabbit hole of like I found this new person that I never would have found before and now I love all their stuff. Mm-hmm. And I and I've subscribed to five different podcasts so I can follow them across these different appearances. 
yeah, it's great. I love just being exposed to things that like I wouldn't necessarily seek out. Um, that's why I like game bundles, like Indie Apocalypse, but also 10 milligram, MT, right. uh, Dread Act, all those things. Yeah, they're, are great. They're they're they're, they're like, giving you everything and like, hey, here it's very much like the anthology. I wish because 10 milligram is technically a bundle, right? That's I mean I I think so. I, that's yeah. how I picked it. I know you can technically buy the games individually, right? But I think, I think people should be people... like real hard fast and like force people to download everything so they have it all on their computer no matter what. Yeah, I mean it. I think. Yeah, I mean, but once you bought it, it's, it's right. You'll probably hopefully check it out anyway. Yeah, but I like that. You know, it's a ten-minute game, so it's not a big time investment. Yes, Same yeah. with college radio or whatever where it's like you'll hear this weird experimental thing probably maybe you think that's terrible but it's only a three minute right it's not like you know time investment while you're doing something else it's it's a little harder of a sell with like movies yeah and telling people to subscribe to i don't know criterion channel i mean you should pretentious I, answer but well um i <laughs> want me to go run and grab my little and jangle my criterion premiere member whatever my little lanyard they sent me oh did you get one of the oh, okay i didn't subscribe at the beginning yeah. i know what you're talking about yeah and I, I got one of, I <laughs> Unsur- wow unsurprisingly the guy who makes who curates an indie game zine likes the criterion channel no, it's okay. I, I I'm a big fan of it too. But I'm just saying, like, yeah. it's harder to tell people to go watch a two-hour movie that they might hate. Right. Even though I'll, I've done that before, and I I it's been hit or miss. But when it hits, it's like the best thing ever. Yeah. They discover something new. Um, I think it's just good to expose yourself to things that you're not sure how you're going to feel about it. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm a big fan of. Listen, okay, before I go on a tangent about how I think people misuse the term Lynchian, we're going to go on a break. Okay. Um, and we will be back in about three minutes. Well, thank you for being here, Michael. Well, and thank, thank you, you for, for sticking around. Me. Hopefully. Yeah, I will. All right. Hello, and welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. And we are here now without one second. Okay. I thought I was going to cease. Anyway, anyway, we're here with our third guest, Kita. Hey, Kita, how you doing? Yeah, how's it going? It's going good. Hello, how you doing? Go, wait, I already asked you that. Never mind. So, Kita, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, solo indie dev, uh, much like everyone else. Um, studying computer science and uh, just making games in my free time. Now the other important question to piggyback off of that, because um, you your game die was in what like the s- third issue of Indie Apocalypse, I think. No, the second. You were the second. <laughs> My God. Um, yeah, it was the second issue. Yeah. How did you hear about Indie Apocalypse? That is an important question because you were the second one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually got an email. I think it was, and uh, I thought it was a scam at first, but <laughs> I just uh, looked into it and. Uh, decided to submit this uh, game that I had been working on, which um, Dyad was like my first project that I challenged myself to just finish something and finish something that I felt proud of making. Because in the past, I've worked on like small games, even smaller than Dyad, and... Um, before that I was working on and off on like a five year project that I never finished. (laughs) Right. Right. I'm familiar with that kind of work. Wait, did I email you about it? Or was it somebody else like completely unrelated? It feels so long ago. I don't remember. Um, I think it was you. I'm not sure though. So well, then maybe you didn't find it. Because well, I know that one came in, like, especially because, like, uh, the first one I had completely, um, like, built myself just by, like, cold emailing people. 
through just like right. f- finding emails through like game jam pages and everything because it was all Massachusetts based. No, if, I, if it is, I long deleted it. Oh, I might have even sent it through a different. I don't think the indie podcast email exists. Anyway, let's, so like I think issue two like doesn't even have 10 entries technically. Like, I think it only has, like, eight submissions or something because, like, technically not everyone includes was submitted. It was just, like, people I had met, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll include my game in that one. But yours was, like, a very good, like, early entry. Like, oh, okay. There are, like, games here that I can get. I can – maybe this thing will work because coming out of the first issue, I was like, I have no idea if this will work. It took oh, me like, like a month to, you know, build, send, I should probably, you know, get like 10% of my emails answered kind of thing, you know? Right. It was, um, yeah, it got a, kind of a surprise to get that in my email, I think, if I remember correctly. <laughs> right. <laughs> that it, if it was that way. I'm pretty sure it was because I didn't. I didn't find it um, on itch or anything, even though I had been on itch. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it had been ever featured until like maybe like the third or the fourth issue, even like it ever got like the front page feature. So I can understand how like nobody would have been able to find it. So now, do you do like a lot of game jams in addition, or do you like tend to tunnel yourself onto like a single project? Uh, I would really like to do like a bunch of game jam stuff. I think that would be really fun. But uh, I don't. The way my mind works, I think, is I just focus on a project and <laughs> yeah. makes try and make something really ambitious. Even though it's maybe not as uh, I try to go for something ambitious while also uh, knowing my limits and knowing what I can finish. <laughs> right. You want to spend because, like ten years on like the project and you put it out and people are like, oh, well, I no one notices. Right. <laughs> right now, I'm working on a game, and the plan is to release an early version of it okay. on itch and then uh continuously update it with new content over time now like like but not like early access style or like here is a vertical slice i'm going to update this vertical slice over time um i don't i'm not really sure what early access means because it kind of right well, <laughs> games more like just... Yeah. Yeah, like or like more like is will will the game the version you release early eventually morph into the full game or will it always be like a shareware version that gets updated mechanics and that sort of thing? Um I plan on like having a way to beat the game and then like you can do different there will be like more things to explore and stuff like that. Okay. So, or like more random uh, variations and stuff because it's it's a roguelite. I think is how they is the genre. <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> whatever, Either, whatever that means anymore. Yeah, some people say roguelite. Some people say it's roguelike. But if it's if it's not turn based, then it's not a roguelike. But I don't know. Are you talking about the German interpretation? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you sure it's not a um, oh oh no I miss whatever I lost it I forgot what's it what's the name of that very very famous roguelike that's not rogue uh, it's net something net hack net hack yeah is it net hack like net hack like net net hack like <laughs> <laughs> is is the game that I'm working on a net hack like yeah. How many potions can I drink? <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they identified? I I've 
been thinking about something like that, but it would definitely be like a whole new, like, yeah, it would be a new mechanic and it would, it's like, you know, different from all the stuff that I've been working on so far. Yeah. But no. Yeah. Cause I, I asked about earlier what the, um, like the, the like the what the scope of that the free version was because I've thought before about the idea of like oh what if we put out instead of like everything's early access or everything is like wait forever till it's done like the the equivalent of like putting out like EPs for games where it's like here's like the mechanic of it and everything and here's like the conceptual idea of it but like a shorter version of the full game right so like a like a demo where it just has a vertical slice yeah yeah like a demo and like the like a strict it's like i'm thinking not game demo necessarily where it's like you know here is like it like it's a complete game but it's just very small it's like a very demo in terms of like a like a music demo like complete but not uh like there's more yeah to it but it's still complete Right, it's like here's here's my draft of it. That would be cool. Here is like the idea of like, oh, okay, so the people like aren't like wallowing in foreverness, but they're also not like strict, you know, putting yourself to like an episodic content schedule or anything. But you get to put things something out that exists and get people's attention. And then... Yeah, my what would be ideal is if. Um a small community formed around the game and they like gave me feedback and uh, I just continuously made more content and uh, the like appeal of the game became the stories that people tell about what happened in their run and stuff like that. Yeah. That's always the, you know, the ideal rogue whatever whatever dream you know mm -hmm. that it becomes in almost like like almost close to like what tabletop is in a weird kind of way where it's like it's a it's a collection oh, of yeah. sy it's a collection of systems w from which like stories emerge i love stuff like that uh i'm doing a D, &D campaign with some friends uh we're probably going to play tonight, actually. Later. Yeah. But it's... I love... Uh, just allowing the player to have... To make these interesting decisions and then watch it all play out and then <laughs> have to deal with uh, the consequences or uh, just something random occurring and you don't know what's going on and then when you finally figure it out it's like oh that's really funny right are you, <laughs> do you, are you a player or do you run the game uh player mostly okay. i've i've been the dm for a short one-off campaign and that was pretty fun um some of the players were playing for the first time yeah so it was uh pretty cool that's an interesting because I have gone so long without ever having because I we have week I have weekly sessions at this point, but never with like new players. Always with like the same players, and it's been like that for years upon years. Yeah, I I, mo I mostly just play with uh, my main group of right. friends, and we usually play in person, um, but we've been playing online. Uh, yeah, yeah. Such as the way for all of us. Yeah. Now, I gotta ask because uh, this is something I like. I'm always interested about about different like gameplay groups of how much do you as a player, and I guess you and your fellow players, how much are you trying to win the game while you play? <laughs> uh, I think it varies. Okay. Um, I think it's really important to play your character as a character right yeah so they have their motivations and their uh flaws and all that um so 
dying tends to be something that people don't want to do so that's so it, the player characters will do everything in their power to keep themselves alive yeah and um so that's that's usually considered winning by at least to me is not dying <laughs> okay because <laughs> it's always because we like with my own group we have a very much like players love to, we we love to lose or like put ourselves mm -hmm. in bad situations and like right. we also do like a lot of one shots i guess so that makes a bit of a difference I, I feel like for us especially with our dm um it's not necessarily our characters getting themselves into bad situations yeah. but just finding themselves in bad situations and not knowing how to get themselves out <laughs> okay because i always um, wonder cause... I remember having a discussion with someone like at a like an after party and they're talking about how they went through all the complicated rules of like D and D and all the stuff, so their players were like super like, Oh, I did this amazing thing of like I am a god now. Like, oh wouldn't it be bet wouldn't it be funnier or like more entertaining if you like were bad? <laughs> but I'm also like I played we played like a series of games and like this is like an old adaptation of like A D and D, one of those offshoots of those I forget the other word for it. But uh, my were at, my characters died I had a character who died pretty much every single session. I think once I died twice in a session. Jeez. <laughs> it's like but it's also like a thing where like I touched a pillar and my brain went to space or something and I died. Because I accidentally touched a pillar I wasn't supposed to touch. <laughs> the the danger level of uh, the the campaign or w whatever uh, sort of story the characters are in it could v vary widely depending on the DM. I feel like because yeah. we've also done things where it's very clear, like oh these are long forms, so your characters are pretty much never going to die, probably. But like, so like the danger isn't inherently there. It's, I guess it's like the group dynamic is always different. Right. Um, I think we were talking about just, uh, bad situations in D and D like our, our main campaign that we play in person and that's on hold until we can play in person again. Yeah left off on a very bad cliffhanger because uh, none of us have any of our equipment and uh, one of us was snatched away and we we don't really know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we, we have like a prisoner and we'll probably, we'll probably try and interrogate him and have him tell us where they took our friend. But it's looking pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, how does that? Now, how does that work structurally? Do they like not like? Do they do all their stuff in secret, or are they just like like what? What does your friend do while they're spirited away, like at the table? Um, we've had situations like it before, um, and I think we the DM just tries to quickly get to the point where we are in the same area again. Oh, okay. So I guess they just kind of chill out for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is not really ideal, but I, in, in D and D there tends to be as, or at least in our group, one person doing like leading the group sort of at a time. Yeah. And it's not always the same person, but um, the the amount that each player contributes isn't like it's not like everyone's uh, doing something at the same time. Right, right. Because it'd be chaotic to do that kind of thing. Right. Unless you're just like really a hundred percent like in the moment, in the zone, and like everybody's yeah. out there like role playing their ass off. Yeah, I feel like that's the those are the best moments when uh you're trying to figure something out and everyone's uh thinking about it and talking in character and doing all these different things. 
And if only you could, and that is, and <laughs> that is like, I guess the beauty of like that kind of like emergent design that doesn't really, or that like emergent storytelling that doesn't fully exist in like digital, like, I guess there's like, it's possible in like cooperative games, mm-hmm. but to try and like, I guess, I mean, we, I, was, I was also talking to people, there are solo role-playing games. Mm-hmm. And some have been submitted. But the, I was going to say a computer, or there there are limitations and a computer can't allow you to do every possible action in right. a world. <laughs> you can't just suddenly be somewhere else. Right. However, um, have you ever played AI Dungeon? I've I'm familiar with it loosely. It is amazing. <laughs> I I love AI Dungeon. It's it's so cool. Um, I, think, I think that might be one of those situations where I'm like, I'm one step away from knowing the person who makes AI Dungeon. Oh really? Or, or maybe I've met them. Before. I think they're local to me. I can't remember though. Because I remember hearing about it a while ago. For like, people unfamiliar with it, it's like a text-based adventure game, but um, instead of it being a set uh, programmed game, it's handled by an AI that has been trained, I guess, on a bunch of different adventure games and dialogue, and it tries to... Um, make an output for any any kind of action or any uh, scenario that you type in so you, you can do ridiculous things that no one would even think of uh making a response for in the game and it'll try and find a scenario for it so it kind of like is like the tries to replicate like the perfect game master right yeah it's like an ai game master basically and one who's like oh i don't believe in rails i believe in whatever the players want to do which is a whole other like i I feel like you could spend forever talking about like the philosophy of like how to run a role-playing game or like how people prefer to run role-playing games i am yeah but I bet there are a few books written on the subject. Uh, Or there's like, which, you you know, you just fall, you know, a few Twitter followings away from seeing role playing game discourse, every crop up of like, well, no, players should have 100% agency. Players should have complete agency and the game master is just there to caress them along. Or no, (laughs) let the game master make their walled garden and they slowly guide the players through it. Well, there is a reason why there usually is some kind of dice roll involved with right. things and uh, stats and the extra player at the table, really different s- strength levels of uh, your monsters or uh, villains. Yeah, but I've also there was yep, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, there was a. Um, I think one of the first times I ever played D and D, there was like this uh, warlock that was the main villain, and he came crawling out of like a bottomless pit or something, and I just said, "Okay, I'm going to try and push him down it," and then I rolled and I got a twenty, <laughs> and then that was it. <laughs> so <laughs> funny you mention that <laughs> because that is like. I mean, geographically, the opposite of something that happened, I think, in the last time we had played D&D some time back. Because, surprise, the weird guy who runs the indie cuisine also plays a bunch of weird indie one-shots, primarily. Um, so we had someone who was a warrior who had, like, cross-skilled into, like, I think it was like a rogue or some... It was whatever the whatever I forget what class it was, but it had, like, it was a skill called, like, Executioner's Noose, where you could throw, like, a shadow noose or something and he was terrible with it because it was like way off stat and he's like never worked but there was like a 
some kind of warlock or wizard or lich or something up on a giant platform and he used it, you know, same exact thing. He rolled like a 20 and yanked the dude down and then it's like he's a tiny robed guy and everyone just like beat him to death. <laughs> From just like the safety of his platform with his weird cross skill that almost never worked. It, it's, it's really... There, there have been multiple moments uh, playing D and D where it's almost comedically anticlimactic. Yeah, yeah, they were, was... <laughs> which is great because that's how some that's how it should be sometimes. Right. I had someone. I was talking about this with someone who like runs an actual play a couple episodes ago and he was talking about how we we're talking about how like the um like the dice is like this perfect like agent of chaos with no goal in mind and it just like exists to be unpredictable at the table and like players sort of like build the narrative out of it and they're trying to like accommodate this person who who accommodates nobody else <laughs> Very much it, it, it creates story. It creates the story in a way that uh, you wouldn't really be able to without thinking about chance, right? Or like having like a group we, that is it, like very quick thinkers. Because if everything happened, uh, if everything happened in the way that you predict, then it wouldn't be exciting. Right, or if like the stats were too reliable in their, like their outcomes. Hmm. Actually, I think rogues can get ridiculous bonuses to the point where like uh, they can almost always succeed on certain things. It's um. It's like uh, uh, one of their features. Yeah. Well, that's up to the game master to put them in situations where they can't succeed. <laughs> they have to... Yeah. Well, it's it's only for things like history or like uh, stealth and stuff uh, like that. But even then, <laughs> it's, that's pretty strong. The old classic of going to the library. Yeah. <laughs> I play a lot. I play a lot. We play, we've played a lot of games that involve going to the library as a key action. I actually have a. Um, uh, knowledge domain cleric in one of my other campaigns that is probably uh, on the shelf for good, but uh, it was fun. He's fun to play because he's kind of just like a nerdy uh, guy that kind of just rambles about uh, random knowledge. Yeah. And most of the other party is e there's. There's like a mercenary guy who doesn't really uh, th think about much of anything, <laughs> and a uh, vain paladin like conqueror who just doesn't really think about anything other than themselves. Right. <laughs> so it's a really fun dynamic for those characters. Now, do you find within your group that you that people like very that naturally like start playing to type, or do people like to like change it up? Like, oh no, 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 I'm a nerd this week, but then I'm just like a mindless fighter the next. Uh, I don't play very many uh, campaigns oh, or right, different yeah. campaigns, but yeah. um, when we do start new games or uh new characters uh they they do often have different uh personalities and okay stuff so it's it's pretty it's pretty good variety now as we are getting towards the end of our our little moment here i have to ask you uh uh, what would you recommend? It's not a game to people to play, to try not to play because they can't play because it's not a game. Oh, I I 
can I cheat on this one? <laughs> because uh, it's, it's me, not. Let me see. It's not a it video depends game. the level of your cheat. Depends the level of your cheat. I may or may not veto. <laughs> it's not a video game, but okay. I feel like it's different enough, and uh, enough of like something that people don't necessarily uh, think about that often, or it's not. Um, I, I'm not really sure how to say it, but it's it's a game. Okay, well, well what it's, is it? Don't hold on. It's, ch it's chess. Okay, I, I've heard of it. That's yes, the game with I, the lady, I, I, right? The lady plays it. In the, the lady plays. Oh, you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Think everyone's yeah. talking about for this week and a half. Right. Um, haven't seen that show. Not have I. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, looks interesting but um yeah it there's something about it that is really uh it's just it, it's a beautiful game so you know if you ever get a chance to play it um i really recommend it especially if you're interested in game design yeah because it's it's probably one of the most well-designed games in history. Yeah, I will. I will let chess slide, being an ancient game unowned by anyone, <laughs> freely in the public domain. Right. All right then. Well, well, thank you. Um, we will be back with everyone in but a moment. Thank you, Kita, for this segment, and thanks for talking to me. And we will be yep. back in like three, fun. three and a half. Uh, goodbye. Okay, everyone, welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. We're here in the final segment of Indie Apocalypse, which is the group segment. Hey, everyone, how are you all doing? Yo. Hello. Good. Now, usually I say, well, what's going on here? I don't have anything prepared. But now, around this Christmas season, I, I finally do have one thing prepared, an important question that I need to ask everyone. I needed a second, third, and fourth opinion on this. So are you all familiar with Christmas songs, broadly speaking? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, just listen to a 25-hour marathon of them. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so this is something I I thought about. So you know the song about, is it just called I Saw Mommy Kiss Santa Claus? Or does it have like a shorter official something, name? Something, I think, I there's probably a chunk of that song in parentheses. Yeah. But. I saw mommy parentheses kissing Santa Claus, but okay. So I would say about a year, couple year or so ago, I had this realization with that song. And I'm like, Oh, Santa Claus is the father. But yeah, then, I just realized that too. But then, just... but, but then I'm like, why did I think that for the majority of my life that it was just regular Santa Claus? And I would say, no, no, it's actually Santa Claus. And I was opening that up to the court of public opinion, whether or not... Because, okay, here's my, here's my justification. In most Christmas songs, Santa Claus is a canonical figure that exists. Like, he's understood to be like... So there's, there's, and there's a song in which people are plenty horny for Santa, in which theoretically he exists as well. Also... Have you considered that he's both... Oh, I, that is a, <laughs> the third option we are not approached yet. But my my final reasoning is like, okay, so the father was dressing up as Santa so the, the kids would see them. So why would why would they be kissing if they were expecting the kid to see them? Because that's why he was dressed up in the first place. So I gotta I gotta know what's the real answer. Who is Santa? Is it Santa or is it a father? Well, do you think that Santa was expecting the kids to see Santa in the outfit? Well, I mean, that's the presu the presumption. If Santa is presumably the father, as my like obvious moment would lead me to believe, that would be they would assume they would they would be seen. So why would they why would they be kissing if they're expecting the kid to see him? Is it not like in the middle of the night when they would assume? 
the kid would be asleep. Well, then why well, is he dressed up as Santa? Dress up. Exactly. <laughs> this is where I got caught up. Well, I don't, you know, it's, sometimes you just gotta dress up as Santa. Okay. All right. For for reasons. Okay, I'll I'll allow Santa play as an I option. The that was just something I had to. I was thinking about, and I just had to <laughs> had to have other opinions on. Without just having the internet answer that question for me. Yeah, you're right. I guess this song doesn't make sense. If we're I haven't heard the I haven't heard the whole song, so I, I don't really know if there's any evidence that would point to any <laughs> <laughs> any conclusion. I, yeah, I guess I also haven't looked it up on Genius yet, so I'm not sure. No, because the lyrics specifically say that they thought he was asleep. No, so, but from the I'm child's looking... perspective, the child says they thought they were asleep. Oh, well. It's, yeah. don't, forget, don't forget it's all from the child's POV. Maybe they were the parents were role-playing and the kid walked in on something. <laughs> that's, I mean, I'll accept that's also entirely a possibility. But I just wanted to get that off my chest. I felt like I needed to say that. Um, I guess related, is there anything you've, like, any other, like, really obvious fact you came to, like, ideally on your own, what, what would feel like much too late in life? I mean, like, outside of Christmas song yeah, lyrics. Yeah, outside of Christmas okay. songs, outside of just in the broad world, like something like, oh, I had not realized this play on words or this obvious plot point in a movie or like what a different, like entirely different song is about. Uh, kind of related, but I guess it's, you know, when you hear a weird word and then you look up the definition because you don't know what it means yeah and then you start hearing it all the time right that that gets me <laughs> it's like ha is this word actually that common or is something going on here with the universe right yeah i it's, it's like some kind of weird perception thing that your brain does where it's like points at points out all the things that are new exactly like i makes them seem more significant fairly recently along that line of thought i had played like in the first or the second episode i don't remember what it was i played this song by this long defunct japanese like jazz punk band or punk jazz whatever and then like a week later it's like Ryan Holmberg, you know, prolific manga translator was like talking about he was how he's getting into that very same band. And I was like, I've literally never heard anyone talk about this before. The band being Midori. What's it called? Mi Midori. Midor. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, maybe people have been. And I'm like, well, I guess I could find like I like it's not 100 percent non-existent because obviously I found it. But I had never heard anyone talking about it until that moment. And then it was like a week between me playing it and then someone else talking to it. And obviously he was not watching this radio show. Presumably. But. Oh, oh no. I, I had a, I had a, I've also have like this. I'm running into this issue, like this weird mental issue where because partially because I want to be able to reach more developers and partially because I want to read indie comics, I'm learning Japanese and I'm running up against like words and I'm like, do I just say them the American way or do I just like, now that I know the proper pronunciation of them, do I say them like an asshole? <laughs> Am I an asshole if I say, if I pronounce it karate? Or some abbreviation uh, of it. 
depends where you are, probably. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess it, I guess it would depend where you are. But um, the main thing is to be understood, I guess, yeah. is the idea. I think as long as people know what you're saying. Yeah. I just realized, I'm like, oh, I'm technically saying a lot of these words wrong. But is it different because they're loan words? So technically I'm saying them correct, the loan diversion correctly. There's that. I wish I knew off the top of my head. There's a word. It's, it's, a, it's a French word for loan. I think it's a French word for loan words, but it's not a loan word. It's the other type of word that's not a loan word. I went down this hole of looking this up once, but I don't remember what it was. And I wish I had remembered. Anyhow, uh, does anyone have any questions for anyone else that they were like thinking of at the moment, but not so urgently that they could need to jump in? Uh, let's see. I, I was thinking about Godot when it was brought up a lot because um, that's the next engine that I was thinking about learning how to use. Um, and I know there's like a lot of resources online, probably, but um, uh, I think it was John. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where? Uh, where did you start? First, start learning about how to use it. I started with their default first project in their tutorial documentation, mm. and I think I went through a lot of their tutorials they'll have like specific tutorials just to teach one Godot specific topic like they have one for signals I think where you create a button and you attach a function to the on click and you just figure out how to connect it together and then that's like one tutorial and then another tutorial for some other concept I think I did maybe three or four of them and they were pretty good and then I did a game jam and I was forced to figure out how to get stuff to work and just Googling. That's how I learned it. Okay, so it seems kind of like a similar process to Game Maker, at least. Probably, yeah. I highly recommend Godot. Yeah, I, I really like what Godot, Godot is doing because it's open source and uh, it's probably going to be around for a while. Yeah, and was it... Did, did you say you're studying computer science? Yeah. Yeah, so I I knew a little bit of front-end development with React.js, and they have a similar kind of overall philosophy of having kind of like a tree structure where components could render children nodes and stuff like that. And mm. that concept is kind of the same in Godot where everything is branching is a branching node from the root node so if something breaks then every, then not everything will break yeah so you could have like some scene that's a couple of nodes and that could run completely independently and that's just going to get instanced in one part of the scene tree and it operates completely it could operate completely independently and stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't know if that, if, yeah, I don't know if, like, if that you did took classes on like uh, React JS and stuff, but some of that could be transferable. Well, cool. Um, unless anyone has anything else. All those other segments ran somewhat long, and we are past nine o'clock. And I like to keep this at least at like a approximate two hours, just so it doesn't run on literally forever. Uh, also because it's nine o'clock for me, I want to do other stuff. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> and we have seemed like we are like ah, oh, it's relaxed. Everyone's like ah, oh, yes, calm. No pressing matters at hand. So if we'll get to the important part of everything, which is we're gonna get into the plugs. John, what do you need to? What do you got? What do you got to plug? Um, I just released a game called Cats on Mars with Doof and Mafgar. 
it's the artist and musician. You can check it out on my itch page at johnskilski.itch.io and check it out. And I guess have a happy holiday. Oh, perfect. Michael? I guess I uh, you can if you have an interest in indie games made in Michigan, uh, you can follow locally sourced, which is uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, but on Twitter it's L O locally S R C D M I. Um, yeah, thank you. Kita? Uh, yeah, you can follow me at um, Green Haired Donkey. That's um, H A I R no E D. So it's yeah, just the um, Twitter page um, announcement sometime next year for a project that I'm working on. All right. So you can check that out. Perfect. 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 And I, as always, Andrew and I would say to recommend that you, I don't know, I guess follow me at Pizza Pranks if I'm assuming you already do if you got here. But also, buy an apocalypse everywhere. Subscribe to it. Subscribe to the newsletter. Make all the numbers go up in all the places. Indiepocalypse.com will get you everywhere you need to go. And then just spend all that money that you would otherwise spend on dumb bullshit. Spend it on my dumb bullshit. And support two of the people here. And support one of them here, I believe, I like to think in spirit. Um, that's it. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. What's a human being gotta be like? What's a way to just be competent? These sweet instincts ruin my life. Every other day I'm wondering, was it a mistake to try and be fine? What I'm certain's mad incompetence. These sweet instincts ruin my life. Boot and suit.
attached to passengers, we've now reached our destination. We hope you enjoyed the flight and have a nice day.